morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you here. Thanks for coming out. Is it my turn? It, it is now. <laughs> Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you're a guest, honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. If there's anything our church can do for you, hope you'll let us know. Um, we can uh, pray with you if you've got a concern, a need, a worry, a fear. Uh, you can tell one of us, but there's also a card on the pew in front of you. You can uh, seat in front of uh, you. can write that down. Put it in the collection plate later. If it's if it's a private thing, just put a note on there. I just want elders and staff to pray about this. Fold it over and stick it in there. If you want the whole church to pray about it, just put it on there, and, and we'll get everybody on their knees about it. We're just glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. If you are looking for a new church home, we would love to talk with you about Twickenham. In fact, the next couple of weeks, you're going to have a great opportunity to do that. We have a program called Starting Point. It's a two-week class on Sunday mornings. 9 to 9.45, there's coffee, and Steve, we can have donuts or something, can't we? Steve, will have donuts, all right? We just, that's how we make decisions here. We just say it out loud, and it happens, so. Um, but if you've, if you've signed up for that, that's ne that starts next Sunday. If you have not signed up for it, and, you, and you're thinking about Twickenham, this would be a great place for you to come learn about who we are and our story and what God is doing here. And if you just, if you haven't even been thinking about finding a church home, you're just kind of curious, what are these people all about? Come to the class. It's free. Uh, child care is provided. And they're donuts. <laughs> so, and Steve Krieger, Steve, you do this, don't you, Steve? Are you the guy that does that? He is now. <laughs> Steve's doing it. Hands down, the nicest man at Twickenham. Hands down, the nicest guy at Twickenham. So, He's kind of hard to get along with in the office, but other than that, he's, <laughs> he's just fine. He's just fine. Hey, if you were not here Wednesday night, wow, did you miss an incredible God moment. We had 15 kids who were uh, been with Art and uh, his team uh, on a, a trip down to the uh, Gulf Coast, and they talked a lot about Jesus, and 15 of them were baptized into Jesus on Wednesday night. Their, their names are Darren Batts, Noah Emerson, Savannah Jones, Lissette Brown, Priscilla Rodriguez, Quincy Kent, Shalance Watkins, Kenesia Turner, Alan Cruz, Summer Bodie, Tiana Carter, Elijah Allen, London Crutcher, Anicia White, and Ariana Allen. So let's give those kids a hand. That's awesome. Art and your team, man, thank you. These guys are doing some great work, great work. That was when, Now, this coming Wednesday night, I think it's our last... Well, okay, I'm saying it. It's going to be our last uh, dinner and Devo. Is that right? Is it the last one? It is the last one. You get tickets. Uh, you can get tickets out here after service. And it's the, we've been, we've been doing odd characters and strange stories in the Old Testament. The lesson we'll look at this week is the UFOs in the Old Testament, okay? <laughs> and some of you guys at NASA probably know more about that than I do. So that's the way it is. So we're going to enter into our worship uh, with, a, with a, to me, this is a new song that we're going to sing. I love this song. It's a beautiful song. And I thought this would be a great scripture to lead us into it. It is good to praise the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. Let's praise him together. I am seeking, searching for the things this world has rejected, the things that are broken, that are flawed, thrown away and discarded. I seek the lost, the damaged, forgotten things, the overlooked and the neglected, the things that have been pushed aside and left behind. Why? Why do I do this? Why chase after that which is despised by so many? It is because I have chosen the rejected. I bring restoration to the broken. I see beyond the flaws and the imperfections, and I bring new life to the lost. This world has called them useless and 
garbage, hopeless and unwanted. They have been scarred, abused, ignored, and unloved. But I, I have reclaimed them. And they belong to me now. They are my masterpiece. And I have a plan and a future for every single one. For I am crafting these dissonant and discarded pieces into something beautiful. Yeah. 
Let's pray together. Lord God, we're just thankful for this morning that we've come together to worship you, to acknowledge that you are our God and that you sent your son to be that sacrifice for us. And for that sacrifice, we're just so thankful. For Lord, we know that without that sacrifice, we would have no hope. But because of what you've done for us, we can trust you that you will keep your promise for us and that you have saved us and are holding a place for us forever with you. Lord God, just help us to be a faithful witness. When times come where Satan tries to put things in our lives to attempt us to, to go away and not acknowledge Christ as our Savior and our Lord, that we will see that happening and that we won't fall into that trap but continue to always be a faithful witness to you. Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings that you do give us. And sometimes we just overlook the little things that you're doing and don't see the big picture. But then we just need to step back, Lord, and see that all the little things that you're doing are towards a big goal that you've got for us. And just help us to, to realize that you do work behind the scenes a lot of times. And, even though we don't see it, but we do trust that you are working in our lives. And Lord, we're just thankful that we can say that, that you do love us enough that we're never beyond redemption, that there's nothing that could ever separate us from you and your love. And even though we do sin and we do things in our lives to really mess things up, that you're still there for us that you're willing to forgive and you're willing to take us back. And Lord, help us to share that message with others around us. Help us to be the faithful witness to show people that, that you have changed our lives, that they can be changed too. And help us, Lord, to always do your will in our lives. We pray for those that are hurting in this congregation, for those that are sick, for those who are having to go through different things that are attacking their bodies and, and putting a lot of pressure on them and, and a lot of concern for their families. And we just raise them up to you and, and pray for strength during their trials and their times. And for the families and for all of us that are praying and, and trying to help them and just help us to always support each other. For we know, Lord, that more than anything, we need the, the strength of each other to, to get us through those times. And Lord, we just pray that we can be in a shining light and a shining example to others around us, and especially for Art and the kids that were baptized this week. We just thank you so much for, for their witness and for their lives and for their, their starting that Christian walk and help them, Lord. We know that Satan will be right after them but help them to always be a, a faithful witness for you. And we just thank you for all the lives they're going to touch as they grow up and, and be around the kids that they'll, they'll be around and as they grow up to be older individuals and, and walk through their lives. Just be with them and give them strength they need to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Lord, just be with us today. Help us to worship you and fill our hearts with your spirit and as we've sung already you know we, we realize lord that you are everything to us just help us to appreciate all that we have and all that you're doing so we're praying in christ's name amen brothers and sisters think of what you were when you were called not many of you were wise by human standards not many were influential not many were of noble birth but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 
God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's take our offering. things from my childhood, but one of my best and fondest memories is running to my dad and him scooping me up in his arms and going and sitting in this large chair that we had in our living room. Now you have to understand my dad was a farmer, so when he came in in the afternoons, he was tired, he was sweaty, um, and he was at peace. He had worked hard that day. But he was my hero. And he held me with those strong arms, and I felt protected. You know, he would wrestle with us at night. He would play. We would have a great time. And we didn't realize what, what he was giving up to be with us. I was protected. I was taken care of. I know that so many of you have that same memory or experience, and it may have been a long time since you have felt that kind of protection and that kind of love and being taken care of. 
I want you to listen to God's love from Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, what good news that is. God is love. Love is not something that God does, but it is who he is. God is love. And we cannot be separated from that love. This morning, as we share communion in our Lord, let us all ask our God to allow that love and warmth of who he is to pour over us. His children here this morning, may we feel that love. If you will, bow with me. Father, we know that you sent your son, and because he knew the love you had for him, and for us, he came to this world to be among us, to live and die a painful death. We know that that pain was physical, but it did not compare to the pain that he felt of all the past and future sins as he took those from us. We know that we are forgiven and have life because you are love. Please help all of us here today to believe and accept your love, peace, and warmth, Father, as we remember the greatness of who you are in our lives. His body given in our stead is seen in this. 
from 1 John 4, 15 through 16. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Please pray with me. Holy Father, as we have taken this bread this morning and as we get ready to, to drink this juice, I ask that you help us to remember that we are loved. Father, we know the difference between a person who is loved and a person who is not. We see it each and every day in our world. Father, help us not to control who we are, to compare who we are, but help us to remember who we are. We are yours. Father, help us to remember that you are the creator the great I am, and Father, that you are love. In Christ Jesus' name. And thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of love we ride Unto shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion. We sing the song of the 
as the redeemed, we stand in awe this morning. Let's stand. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond. Acts chapter 9. I'm sorry, Lincoln's being a jerk. So. <laughs> we have an altar call at the end of the service, and I know you're leading singing, but if you wanted to come forward, I know a lot of people would be. Yeah. <laughs> Acts chapter 9 is where we'll be this morning. Quick uh, note here, next Sunday, we are going to have a very special service. Uh, we'll be uh, commissioning our, our new elders. And so I really hope you'll be here for that. We want to surround them with, uh, with the word and with prayer. And we'll frame all of that in the worship uh, context. So it'll be a, a, an important day for us. Uh, so ne that's next Sunday. I had planned initially, uh, and I, I, I'm still learning our rhythms as a church, and I, I don't quite have them down yet. Uh, but I had planned to start a series after that uh, out of the book of First Peter and talk about how to live like Jesus in a culture that doesn't. Um, and uh, I really wanted to sort of time that out for the beginning of school, but then I remembered that a lot of our kids and a lot, a lot of our folks who are working with our children this summer are still going to be down there for a few more weeks. So I, I'm going to kind of hit the pause button on that one so that all of our kids are back up here for that. Uh, our, our teenage, a lot of our teenagers work with the children uh, during the worship service during the summer, and I, I, I want to wait and make sure they're a part of that because, in a lot of ways, you guys are kind of on the front lines of that that part of our culture. They're out there every day, uh, living. In, and I know we are too, but I, I really want our kids to hear that. So we're going to put a pause on the series from First Peter. We will focus on a series of lessons called "Just Like Jesus," and we're going to talk about how Jesus would respond, how how Jesus handled power how Jesus handled wealth, uh, just kind of how Jesus handled some of the things that we have to deal with, and then we'll, we'll get into that series in First Peter, uh, probably end of August, 1st of September. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Okay, Acts chapter 9, and this is the last in our Inception series. We've been looking at some stories in the book of Acts to try and learn about the things that these first Christians faced and what we can learn from them and how we can learn to respond to some of the things that, that we have to confront. Uh, years ago, I had a, a sister in Christ ask me uh, to visit a friend of hers. 
she, she said, I've got this friend, and we're going to call him Joe for the purposes of the story. It's a true story. Uh, and and uh, she said, I want you to visit Joe. Um, and she said, he's not a Christian. In fact, Joe is just about as far away from being a Christian as a person can get. He doesn't like Christians. He doesn't like religion. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He's got a pretty hard edge, but I would really love for you to go see him because he's been diagnosed with cancer. And it was a really bad cancer too. So this guy was, he, he knew his time was limited. Um, and he was a used car salesman, uh, which is an important part of the story. So I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go see him. And this, uh, by the way, the, the, this lady had fallen in love with this guy. I don't know why, because he really was kind of a hard guy. But she fell in love with him and she wanted me to go see him. And she really hoped that he would become a Christian. And neither one of us thought that was probably going to happen. So I, I went to visit with Joe, and I s went to his house, and I sat down with him. And here's the first thing he said to me, very first words out of his mouth. Never had much use for preachers. Because, <laughs> you know, some people will say stuff like that, and you sort of know that they don't know they shouldn't have said that, right? They're not... They're just sort of socially disadvantaged. And you don't really hold, hold it against them. You just kind of go, well, you know, bless them, you know, bless you. <laughs> Joe was not that way. He knew exactly what he was saying. I mean, he, and that was, he was very socially skilled. And he, I really think he was testing me to see how I would respond. So he said, I've never had much use for preachers. And I went, well, Joe, I, you and I have something in common because the truth is I don't have much use for most preachers either. <laughs> and then I said, and to tell you the truth, Joe, I've never had much use for car salesmen. <laughs> and, <laughs> which was a risk. And he laughed, and so which was good, and we both kind of relaxed. And then from then on, our conversations were pretty congenial. I'll tell you more about Joe later on. But you know what I bet? I bet you know somebody like Joe, somebody that you would call a long shot for conversion, somebody that doesn't want to have anything to do with Christianity or with Christ. They're just not interested. It, you know, it, it, it could be that theirs is an intellectual skepticism. Uh, it, it could be that they're just they have outright disbelief. Maybe, maybe they've had a bad experience with Christians or with church or with religion, but for whatever reason, just like Joe, they're just not interested. They're a long shot. Now, if nobody's coming to mind, if you're having a hard time thinking about somebody like that, that could mean that you're a little too insulated in the Christian subculture that maybe you need to develop some relationships with people who are not like you and me. Be good for both of you. And it's possible that when you think about somebody who's a long shot for Christianity, the person that comes to mind is you. you know, you're, you're here today, but maybe it's out of habit or out of curiosity, or you're here out of deference to somebody you care about. Regardless, I'm really glad you're here. And I think you're going to find this story interesting. It's a long story, but it's a really good story. It's in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read the whole thing, verses 1 through 19, so it'll be on the screen. I would encourage you, though, to find it in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the fifth book in the New Testament. It's in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Okay, here we go. Meanwhile, we're going to read this, then we're going to pray. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if you found any there who belonged to the way, that's the way they described Christianity back in those days, the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? Lord, Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They 
heard the sound, but they didn't see anybody. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Three days. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. Would you do that if you got that? Would that is that how you would respond? <laughs> yes. No, it's not how you'd respond. You'd be terrified. So would I. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man. And all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Let's pray. God, what an awesome, awesome story. What a great God to have authored it, not just to have put it into words, but to have brought the people into this story, that actual historical moment. We're grateful for the story because so many of our stories, so many of the ways in which we live need this knowledge that you are able to reach people and change lives in ways that are so dramatic that the stories are told centuries later. Some of us need to see that kind of change, Father. And we pray that we would receive it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You would, you would have to look long and hard to find another character in the Bible as unlikely for conversion as Saul. Verse 1 says Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the church. That word still says a lot. Breathing out murderous threats was what Saul had been doing and it was what Saul had every intention of continuing to do. He was a very determined enemy to Christianity. So much so that on his own initiative he went to the high priest in Jerusalem to get arrest warrants for Christians living wherever they had fled. One of the cities to which Christians had fled when the persecution that Paul started that, that broke out in, uh, in Jerusalem, one of the cities they'd fled to was Damascus. That was 135 miles from Jerusalem. That's where Saul was headed when he encountered Jesus. In those days, rapid transit was a fast horse. So you really had to want to travel 135 miles, which tells you something about Saul's determination to see Christianity consigned to the garbage can of history. He wanted to destroy it. Verse 2 says that he intended to imprison anybody who followed the way, men or women. Didn't matter to Saul, young or old, male or female, if you were a Christian, he wanted to see you rot in jail. He meant business. And yet, even though he was the longest of long shots, Saul ends up becoming Christianity's most ardent supporter, its most articulate spokesman, its most influential theologian. We know him as Paul the Apostle. Tom read from one of the things that Paul wrote this morning. That tells us something about how God works. God has always turned long shots into sure things. That's just his history. Abraham was an old man married to an old woman 
They were in their 80s. They didn't have any children. And God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose you, Abraham and Sarah. You guys are going to be the mother and father of the nation of Israel. It's a long shot, but it happened. Moses was born a slave. He became a murderer and a fugitive, and he had a speech impediment. But God says, Moses, you're the guy that's going to be the spokesman for my people and lead my people out of Egypt. Who chooses a murderer, fugitive with a speech impediment to be your spokesman and lead your people? God. And it worked. David, the youngest member of an uninspiring family which held membership in the smallest tribe of Israel, God says, you're going to be Israel's greatest king. Amos wasn't a prophet. His daddy wasn't a prophet, but he becomes a spokesman for God. Jesus. Jesus selected 12 of the most unlikely men ever to be his apostles. I just think that's a great lesson for us. There are probably people you know that you, that you would never consider for faith in Jesus. People that, that we think are, are, are they're too mean or they're too worldly or they're too sinful or they're too skeptical. We, everybody probably should know a soul or two. So if God called you like he called Ananias, to take his message to that person, you'd, you'd probably respond like Ananias did. you got to be kidding me, God. Do you even know who this guy is? Lord, this guy will turn to you about as soon as Nick Saban hollers War Eagle, <laughs> about as soon as Gus Malzahn says Roll Tide. Lord, it ain't going to happen. Speaking of Ananias, we should probably talk about him for just a little bit here, too. After his encounter with Jesus, Saul stumbles into Damascus as disoriented as he has ever been. Everything he believed has been completely upended, and now everything Ananias believes is about to be challenged. Here's a question for you. So Jesus personally appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, and yet God orders Ananias to go finish the job, heal his eyes, explain his mission, welcome him to the family. Why? I mean, why didn't Jesus just heal Saul's sight? Why didn't Jesus just say, Saul, you're going to get a new name, and now you're, this is your mission? Why didn't Jesus conjure up a pool and baptize Saul himself right there on the road to Damascus. Back in Acts chapter 8, a, 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 an Ethiopian official was baptized in a roadside reservoir. It's not like it hasn't happened before. So, so why did God send Ananias, why did God send a human to do his work? Maybe Christianity is not just about getting right with God. Maybe it's also about our relationships with each other. I mean, three days before he met Ananias, Saul was on his way to Damascus to arrest Ananias. Three days before he met Saul, Ananias was trying to decide whether to hide or hightail it out of Dodge. I think God wanted Saul and Ananias to have some face time because they both needed to learn that the way isn't just about getting right with God. It's about getting people right with each other, too. And it worked. I mean, eventually, it worked. Verse 13, when God ordered Ananias to go see Saul, he says, I have heard about this man. Doesn't even name him. Won't even call his name. I have heard about this man. But look at what happens in verse 17. When Ananias meets he who must not be named, he places his hands on him and addresses him as brother Saul. Saul isn't the only person in Acts chapter 9 to have a dramatic conversion experience. Ananias had one too. Maybe you and I need to have a little bit of a conversion experience of our own. Maybe those of us who know Jesus need to have a conversion experience so that we are willing to go to those 
who have not yet had that initial conversion experience. I can understand why God would want a member of the church to, per, to be personally involved in bringing Saul into the fold. He wanted to break down barriers between Christians and those who persecuted them, which is a good thing for us to think about. But why this particular Christian? Why Ananias? He is not what I would call one of the starters on team church. I mean, God could have called Philip, the guy that we read about in Acts chapter 8. That guy was on fire. He'd just gone two for two. In Samaria, he goes in there and he converts the whole town, and then the Spirit takes him and he meets a stranger reading the prophet Isaiah, and Philip baptizes that guy. If I'm managing the team and I need a big hit, I'm going to put in my hottest bat. Then, of course, there's Peter or John or any one of the others starting 12, but why Ananias? This guy walks on the stage in Acts chapter 9, verse 10, and he walks off the stage in Acts chapter 9, verse 19. Paul mentions him in, in chapter 22 when he retells his story, but that's it. You get, if they make a movie out of the book of Acts, actually they're doing that, they're, making, they're, they're, they're doing that movie, I'll bet at the, with the, with the, they, do, they do this story, at the end of that story, when the screen credits roll on the screen, Ananias is going to show up next to bystander number two. <laughs> There's just not much about this guy. There's nothing in the text that suggests that he was a deep thinker, a great teacher, an able debater, or a highly trained recruiter. He was just a good Christian guy. And maybe that's all it takes. I mean, if conversion really is an act of God, if God really is orchestrating events in people's lives to draw them closer to himself, then our part of the mission doesn't require advanced degrees or top secret spiritual clearance. It just requires that we know the story and that we live lives that match it. I think we complicate this a lot when maybe some good information and a lot of integrity are the tools that we need to be who Jesus calls us to be. That and the willingness to refrain from passing judgment on folks that we think are long shots. Like Joe, the used car salesman I was telling you about earlier, the one who didn't have much use for preachers. Joe and I met several times, four or five times, and all I did, the only thing I did, was tell him stories from the Gospels. Stories about Jesus. A lot of them were from Mark, because I just happened to like the Gospel of Mark a lot. On one of, the, one, of our, one of our last visits, I don't think it was the last one, but on one of our last visits, Joe said, well, I guess this Jesus stuff makes sense, but it's too late for me. I got maybe a month left. I have made a lot of enemies, I've done a lot of bad things. I wish I'd known about this sooner. So I said, can I, can I tell you one more story, Joe? He said, yeah, you tell me one more story. I said, okay, well, there was this, there was this vineyard owner who hired some guys at dawn to go work in his vineyard. And I guess after he hired him, he realized that that weren't enough, so he went back and hired some guys at nine in the morning. And he told the guys that he hired at nine, I'm going to pay you the same thing I'm paying the guys that I hired at dawn. Just come work in my, in my vineyard for me. And then he hired some more guys at noon, made the same deal with them. I'll pay you the same thing I paid the guys I hired at dawn. Then he hired some guys at three in the afternoon. And then he, he finally hired some guys at five o'clock in the afternoon. You know, the day is getting late. But he told the guys he hired at 5 o'clock, I will pay you what I paid the, the guys I hired at 5 this morning. So at the end of the day, the vineyard owner brings all the workers together to pay him what he owes them for their day's work. And he starts with the guys hired last, and he gives them their pay. 
Then he pays the guys that he hired at three and at noon and at nine. And the guys at dawn are thinking, man, we're going to get, we're going to make some money because we've been working all day. And he paid the guys he hired at 5 a.m. the same amount he paid the guys at 5 p.m. And here's what Joe said. Joe said, that's not fair. And I said, that's what the guys hired at 5 a.m. said. They said it wasn't fair either. And then I said, Joe, that story's in the Bible. That's the story Jesus told. And you're the guy hired at 5 p.m. And he's going to pay you the same amount he pays me or anybody else. And Joe said, but that's not fair. And I said, no, it's not. But it's just. It's what God does. Joe was baptized a few days later. And a few days after that, he died and then he met the owner of the vineyard who always bets on long shots it is not too late you are not too far gone you have not done so many things God cannot forgive no matter what you have done no matter who you have become God can still reach you God wants to reach you even if you're a long shot because that's what he does if you need to come this morning we'll be here for you so will the Lord let's stand let's sing together let the weak say I am strong let the poor say I am rich let the blind say second we'll close with these things dinner and devo again wraps up this wednesday night 545 stuffed potatoes for dinner um tickets are available in the adult ed lobby as soon as we finish or you can call the church office there is a baby shower today from 1 30 to 3 in the mercy building um jacob and stephanie are expecting a girl and so if you can help support that that'll be this afternoon right down here uh, Red Cross Blood Drive. We'll be hosting a Red Cross Blood Drive on Wednesday, August 5th from 2 to 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. You can sign up for an appointment time in the gym lobby or online at www.redcrossblood.org. Key code Twickenham. Open mic night. Our next open mic night is coming up Saturday, August 8th at 7 in the Mercy Building. If you're interested in performing, you can contact Dave Stewart. Uh, this update, a uh, very sad um, 
and yet rejoicing to report that Clark Anderson's mother passed away last night. She was 94. She was living at home alone. And Clark and Janet told me that she passed away sitting in her chair with her Bible open in her lap. And so the family will be traveling to East Tennessee. Uh, the service will be Tuesday at uh, 3 o'clock with a visitation at 1 o'clock on Tuesday over there. That's Eastern time. Uh, the summer camp kids grew a number of cucumbers that are available for free. As soon as we leave, they're downstairs in the lobby as you go out. So if you'd like free cucumbers, be sure and pick some up. It's been a great day, a great day to be together. We hope that your day continues to be well as well as your week this week. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time that we've been able to come here together and to, to share worship uh, with each other. And we pray that, um, you know, that that worship has, has been, been pleasing to your ears. Uh, we pray that you be with us as we go from here and we go into the world this week. And that you, you arm us to, to minister and to, to act as examples to, to those that are not not currently members of your flock. Thank you for the, the ministers and the staff that we have here at Twickenham and everything that they do. And we pray a special prayer over them as well as our elders, both current and the, the ones that will be coming on here in the next couple of weeks. And pray that you continue to bless them with, with wisdom and, and counsel and guidance that they will, they will pass along to us as a church. Please be with us as we go from here and guide, guard, and direct us in everything that we do. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.